Did that surprise you? <laughs> Today we're going to talk about how to surprise your reader. How to create those thrilling moments of recognition and discovery in a book. And you may be thinking, well, that doesn't really apply to me. I'm not writing a thriller or a mystery book, but on the contrary, it probably does. Almost every genre has small surprises, at least, even if, you know, it's not the kind of surprise that the whole plot depends on. William Faulkner uses these methods, William Shakespeare, we're going to use an example from Neil Gaiman, we're also going to use an example from J.K. Rowling. Almost, if you think about all the books that you read in you know, literary fiction and historical fiction or any genre you might enjoy, there's usually a moment of recognition where something suddenly falls into place and it's such a pleasant surprise for the reader when this happens. Vera Tobin says, stories that aim to entertain should be surprising. And I agree. I think that that's part of entertainment, is giving your reader that aha moment in a book. But how as authors do we create well-made surprises? And that's a term that Vera Tobin uses, well-made surprises. In her book, Elements of Surprise, Our Mental Limits and the Satisfactions of Plot. This is sort of, this is an academic read. It's published by Harvard University Press. Um, and she talks about the ways that the element of surprise is used effectively in narratives. And she explains why it works based on our cognitive limitations. So she brings in research to show why it works. I'll touch a little bit on the research today. The focus is more on how you can use these elements in your own work. From a broad perspective, how do we create well-made surprises? Readers enjoy surprises that illuminate what happened previously, that align with what they've already read, but put it in a new light, that revise their understanding of it. So it's that moment where, as a reader, you realize that you had misinterpreted what had come before, but now you know the truth. Now, you know, everything that you had read suddenly makes sense in a different way. Aristotle called this, and I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of it, an agnorisis. He said, when a story's turning point centers on a moment of critical discovery in which the hero achieves a sudden awareness of the true nature of his or her situation. So what we're going to talk about today is what Aristotle thought of as plots of recognition, those aha moments. And we'll, we'll cover four topics today. There's, there's just so much ground to cover with this topic that I'm going to do a part two video. Today we're covering deceptive character viewpoints, managed reveal, forgot, finessing misinformation and burying information. Those are the four broad topics we'll cover today. Without further ado, let's get into deceptive character viewpoints. Here's what Tobin has to say about it based on cognitive research. People care quite a lot about the provenance of information in theory, but once we accept a proposition even provisionally as fact, we tend to lose track of many particulars of the context in which we encountered it. Blah. What does that mean? Basically what it means is our minds tend not to remember where or how we got a, an idea or a piece or, or any information. So this points to the fact that how often have you said to someone, oh, Hmm, I've I read that somewhere or yeah I heard about that that's your mind remembering the actual idea 
or information, but you don't remember the origin. You don't remember where it came from. Where did you read it? Or who told it to you? This is something that our minds are just not as good at remembering. We take the fact itself, but not the origin of it. So what does this mean for writers? It basically means there's a gap between the information that the reader gets and remembering the character that actually shared that information. And authors can exploit the gap between what the reader is being told and the origin, the provenance of that information. So the character who actually relayed it, which remember, our minds don't remember as easily. Here's an example from J.K. Rowling, The Prisoner of Azkaban. So in this book, Hagrid's beloved Hipgriff, Buckbeak, Buck, uh, Buckbeak's execution is threatened for the first two thirds of the book. So most of the time, the reader has this dread that Hipgriff is going to be executed. The night of the execution arrives and they go to Hagrid to try to give him comfort, to see what they can do. Hagrid says to them, nothing you can do, don't come down, I don't want you to see it. They leave, but they can still hear what's happening in the book. And um, in the movie, they can see sort of some of the action on the side. This is the quote from the book. They leave, but they can still hear the sounds drifting from Hagrid's garden. There was a jumble of dis indistinct male voices, a silence, and then, without warning, the unmistakable swish and thud of an axe. Hermione swayed on the spot. They did it, she whispered to Harry. I d don't believe it. They did it. I'm not a great actress, sorry. Hermione's perspective makes sense given everything we've read. JK Rowling is using multiple strategies that increase the odds that the reader will believe Buckbeak died. It makes sense in the context of everything we've read. We've been told that the execution is inevitable in many ways, including Hagrid's previous quote. And all the characters agree about what happened. No one has any doubt as to what occurred. And yet, there's no authorial confirmation. Because remember, we only got Hermione's perspective. They couldn't see what was happening. They heard the sounds. And Hermione said, I can't believe it's been done. This interpretation is overturned when the children find a way to travel back in time. So it turns out what really happened was they found a way to unshackle Buckbeak. So the jumble of indistinct male voices was over his sudden disappearance. And the swish of the axe was of the executioner frustratedly hitting the fence with it. So everything we're told in the initial account has a perfectly reasonable explanation. Every sound that we heard makes sense with this new perspective, this time authorial confirmation of what happened. So as Tobin says, a common way to present misleading information is through the words or thoughts of a character who has a limited or mistaken view of what's happening. In the world of the narrative, it makes sense. You're just using the character to mislead, but you're not actually lying to the reader because they obviously had a limited perspective. And the reason this also works so well is because readers don't keep the provenance of information in mind as well as they do the actual facts. Buckbeak died. Now let's get into the managed reveal. What does that mean? Tobin says, these are surprise reveals. New information which gives the reader the sense that they're getting the truth about what came before in the story. It's, if it sounds like it's related to the previous example, it is. But 
The key to a managed reveal is to make readers feel like they could have figured it out. So it's, it's as if the clues need to be in front of them, it needs to be in the text so that they feel like they had a chance to work it work out the puzzle and see it before it actually was revealed that's the key to a managed reveal so tobin's example is arthur conan doyle's sherlock holmes story the red-headed league a pawnbroker named jabez wilson seeks the services of sherlock holmes after having answered an advertisement offering work to men with bright red hair his hair fit the bill and he was soon set up with an easy source of additional income, copying the Encyclopedia Britannica in his off hours for good wages. Eight weeks later, Wilson comes back to find a note announcing the red-headed league is dissolved. He wants to know why, and he engages the services of Holmes. As Holmes is going around and picking up clues, he also goes to the pawnbroker's assistant. Excuse me. Can you tell me the way to the Strand from here? Uh, third right, fourth left. Thank you. The reader knows from that account that Holmes looked at the assistant's knees, but he doesn't know anything else. And here's the passage. Holmes's right-hand man, Watson, is narrating here. Evidently, said I, Mr. Wilson's assistant counts for a good deal in this mystery of the Red-Headed League. I am sure that you inquired your way merely in order that you might see him. Not him. What then? The knees of his trousers. And what did you see? What I expected to see. Now why were those knees so important? Turns out that Holmes had noticed how worn and stained the pants were in front of the assistant's knees. The pawnbroker's assistant had made up the red-headed job to keep his boss away from the pawn shop in the afternoons so that he could dig a cellar between the shop and the vault of the bank next door. And here's how Holmes reveals the scheme. I hardly looked at his face. His knees were what I wished to see. You must yourself have remarked how worn, wrinkled, and stained they were. They spoke of those hours of borrowing. The only remaining point was what they were borrowing for. Oh, the reader only knows that he looked at the knees. The reader doesn't know they were stained or worn or damaged. But by mentioning the knees, the reader also feels like the clue was there. They, were, they could have potentially, conceivably, figured out the surprise. And that's what makes it so much more appealing cognitively to the reader. The sense that you could have figured it out. The knees were mentioned. Here's another similar example. This one comes from a researcher, a uh, linguistics researcher named Mark Alexander, who pointed this out in Agatha Christie's story, The Tuesday Night Club. Apparently this was Christie's very first Miss Marple story for you. Of the Christie geeks like me. In the story, The Tuesday Night Club, friends gather to share a real mystery. So each one takes a turn sharing a real mystery, which the others must then attempt to solve. In this particular story, one shares a case in which three people, Mr. Jones, Mrs. Jones, and Miss Clark, had dinner. And shortly afterwards, they all fell ill. They assumed it was food poisoning and Miss Clark died. Now, the only one, surprise, surprise, who's able to solve this mystery is Miss Marple. Miss Marple is part of the Tuesday Night Club. She says the maid Gladys sprinkled the trifle at Mr. Jones's request with poison. When Miss Marple explains how she reached that conclusion, she subtly introduces new information that the reader was not privy to. The narrator, the Tuesday Night Club member who narrated the story says, I can't think how on earth you managed to hit upon the truth. 
I should never have thought of the little maid in the kitchen being connected with the case. No, dear, said Miss Marple, but you don't know as much of life as I do. A man of that Jones's type, coarse and jovial, as soon as I heard there was a pretty young girl in the house, I felt sure that he would not have left her alone. The reader was not told that Gladys was young and pretty. We only knew her name and her profession, Gladys, and she was a maid. That's it. So this information wasn't actually available for the reader to help them figure out the mystery, just like with Sherlock Holmes' knees. But because it comes with information that was available, it gives the reader a sense that, oh, this was pointed out, and I could have known, I should have known that, ah, next time, next mystery, I'll figure it out. <laughs> Topic three, finessing misinformation. What's that? Um, so this is how Tobin refers to it. It's how stories can give audiences false information about what happened or of the identity or significance of particular elements in a story in such a way that a different true account can be successfully revealed later on. Once again, there's a lot of overlap, but there, there are you know, subtle differences between the examples we're talking about. This is to be able, as Tobin puts it, to be able to reveal in the end that some important element of a narrative is not what it seemed. The story must first slip an incorrect interpretation into the reader's understanding of events. And the example she uses is Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue. In Poe's story, the mother and her daughter have been violently murdered, and the protagonist and his friend read accounts of what happened in the newspaper. Here are the quotes. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon, the physician on the scene concluded. A large weapon might have been used if wielded by the hands of a very powerful man. There were also witnesses who heard two voices in contention inside the house. One of the voices heard from within the house said things in French, including, mon dieu. And the second voice, there's a lot of disagreement over the second voice. A Frenchman says he, it belonged to a Spaniard, but he could not make out what was said. He doesn't speak Spanish. And another was convinced by the intonation that he had heard Italian, which he doesn't speak. Getting the pattern here. A Dutch witness who testified through an interpreter said both voices were speaking in French, which is a language he doesn't speak. An English tailor claimed it was German. The second voice was German, also a language he's not familiar with. And an Italian says, no, the second voice must have been Russian. Now, as a reader, we know that the witnesses are unreliable but how? Which language was the second voice speaking in? It turns out it's the underlying assumption that's unreliable. There is no murderer. The first voice is the woman who died. The second voice is an orangutan who committed the murders. As Tobin says, and this is the co another cognitive limitation, people are especially susceptible to information that arrives via presuppositions. Everyone is, is assuming there is a murderer and a second voice so the reader does too. No woman could have inflicted the blows with any weapon. Presupposes there were blows with a weapon. Presuppositions are especially insidious and are usually a great way of delivering false information, finessing misinformation. Let's examine some more. Diana regrets or doesn't regret studying English. Presupposes that Diana studied English. The ambassador didn't get shot. Presupposes the ambassador is still alive. Her husband is bald. Presupposes she has a husband. Tobin says presuppositions have insidious effects on our beliefs, and yet they're very hardy, 
can be downright impossible to kill. Presuppositions treat the information as already known and already part of the shared implicit context. Another way of misinforming, which is also used in this story, is the naming of things. The murders in the Rue Morgue has murders in its title, and yet there were no murders. A murder is a human being killing another human being. So even in the name of the story itself, we have this misleading information and it's in the name. Authors often surprise their readers in the way that they name things. Here are some more examples. Jekyll and Hyde. Well, there weren't two people. Jekyll and Hyde are one person. The Planet of the Apes. You mean Earth? <laughs> and then there's Darth Vader, also known as Anakin Skywalker. Well, if we had known that name early on, there would have been much of a surprise, right? <laughs> so just to recap, ways of delivering misinformation, presuppositions, and the naming of things. Now let's move on to burying information. Making sure it's so far underground. Tobin says, another common component of surprises is the introduction of crucial and ultimately accurate information, but planted in such a way that is overlooked or so that its true significance is only revealed later. There's a long, list of techniques called backgrounding techniques, which three researchers from the University of Glasgow came up with. The link to their paper will be provided in the description below. They list 11 backgrounding techniques, but in this video, for the purposes of this video, we'll go over a few. Some of them are, are very obvious, like, um, don't mention whatever is key to your surprise very often. As has been a common theme in this surprise video, critical elements need to be underspecified. Specificity. This refers to the level of detail at which you describe things. Let's take a look at this example I made up because it describes my bathroom at the moment. Well, no, no, it doesn't, sorry. No, it doesn't. The bathroom sink was a mess. There were bottles scattered around, tubes of toothpaste, spilled powder, hairbrushes, and discarded dental floss. How innocuous did the spilled powder sound right there? A reader would not have noticed it, right? There's a jumble, there are hairbrushes, that's probably makeup that she's talking about. But I use this description because of Vera Tobin's lesson on specificity. Here's the example she uses. You could refer to something as stuff. If you want to get a little more detailed, you could call it powder. Another level of detail, white powder. Further, two grams of white powder. Adding another level, two grams of cocaine. Two grams of cocaine belonging to John Smith. <laughs> yes, I called it powder, but it wasn't as innocuous as it seemed. And yet the clue was there. I said there was powder on the table. In this way, a careful author can contrive not only to make audiences less likely to notice certain elements of the narrative, but also more subtly to make them consider these elements less deeply. So remember to play with how you refer to things, how you describe them. What level of detail do you want? Do you want to zoom in or do you want to zoom out? The more level of detail you give to an object, the more attention the reader is going to give the object. And that's it for today. So we covered a lot of the basics. You're probably familiar with these things, but it's, I found it so important to, 
to sort of see them from this perspective rather than when I'm immersed in the text as a reader, you know, you, you're enjoying the story. So you go along with the author's misdirections, with how they bury information, with how they finesse misinformation, um, with the deceptive character viewpoints. So I hope this was helpful in pointing out how these surprises are hidden in the text and how they're made well. In part two, how to surprise your reader, we're going to get into some really great in-depth examples that Tobin had. Two main topics in the next video are going to be unreliable narrators and surprise narrators. So when narration itself is a surprise and they were really fascinating accounts. In the next video we're also going to get into Jane Austen's Emma and obviously Austen is not one to use big plot twists but she is very good with surprises. So in the comments below please share a surprise that you've used in your own work. Small or big. Actually I think the small ones are are really interesting. Among authors, we should be at liberty to share spoilers of our work, right? So we can all benefit and learn from each other. So don't worry about giving up the surprise. Also, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up because YouTube's algorithms work in such a way that it then helps other authors find the video. I'm excited to, to see what you leave in the comments and see you soon in part two. Bye.